Um, so now after having heard from our two amazing student speakers, we also have two members of the cover faculty with what's up? <laughs> with, um, with amazing stories to tell us and amazing messages to share with us. I want to introduce our next speaker with a little bit of personal story as well. So my freshman year spring break, I went on a GPS trip to Puerto Escondido, Mexico. And upon return from that trip, I decided to take Spanish as a sophomore for my first year's uh, foreign language class. Um, I talked to Ms. Stice, and then she told me that learning about foreign language at Cobra is supposed to be an experience that combines learning about the language itself and learning about the culture. But for my first two years of Spanish in sophomore year and junior year, I didn't really feel like there was a dimension of culture to it. I think I was mainly memorizing conjugation, memorizing grammatical structures and vocabularies, and other things like that. And it wasn't until in senior year when I took Honor Spanish 3, when I really found out how learning language can be this forging of a gateway through which you can really learn about a world that is different from your own. What was so magical about that class? I think it has something to do with that class teacher. So I will now welcome Mr. Bardo to this Um, so my name is Aaron Bardo, and I'm here to lead you through uh, travel to Belize. Um, hopefully you will learn a little bit um, about my life and my learning and how I teach and bring that into the classroom. So my journey started out when I was your age uh, in high school, um, where I went to Phillips Academy Andover. And my father was a teacher there for 40 years. And my brother um, was a year older than me, the captain of the lacrosse team, and definitely kind of a big deal on campus. Um, so I felt that I did not have my own place there and really could not find my own shadow. Um, so I went as far away as possible. Um, and I went to Spain, um, where I went to school year abroad. Uh, and there, um, many things occurred. Um, I'm going to, because I get to see all of you in your awkward high school phases, I'm going to share this with you. Um, there I am with my father, of 40, the, who was the teacher for 40 years, and my brother on his graduation day. So, we travel initially to lose ourselves, and we travel next to find ourselves. My journey is gonna take you through the nine years I lived abroad. Um, where we are going to highlight, there are many stories I'd love to get into, but um, I'm going to highlight um, just a few occasions uh, that really stood out to me and changed um, who I was as a person and also as a teacher and things that I definitely do try to bring into the classroom. You go away for a long time and return a different person. You never come all the way back. When I was living in Spain, um, I was um, out with some friends, and from behind, I felt um, I got hit from behind, um, slapped in the face, uh, in the back of the head, and I turned around and no one was there. Um, and so I thought, okay, I guess I'll just wait, um, because I knew that I was gonna get hit again. And so I did, I got hit again from the other side, and I turned around and I, and I was able to confront this person. And it was a very heated exchange, as you can imagine, at the beginning. Um, but we were able to work through that. Uh, and it turns out that he projected upon me, this is in 2004 and 2005, and what's going on um, at that time period, um, there's a word in Spanish, historia, and that means history and story at the same, uh, in the same word. And that's gonna be something that's repeating throughout this. And in this moment, um, history and my story really interlocked because he projected on me the Iraq War and George W. Bush. Um, and for him, that's what I represented. Uh, I was, you know, George W. Bush, I was this war, um, and he was bringing all that hate onto me. Um, so uh, the lesson that I learned from this experience was that um, we, no matter who our leaders are, um, no matter where we are in the world, those images and the, those leaders get projected upon us. And I think that's something that's very important. Um, and another thing is, is that our actions, we don't know how far they're going to extend in time and in space. 
Um, and so George W. Bush's actions, how those reflected upon me or this person, um, and how my actions reflect upon other people. Um, we never know who we are going to affect or when it's going to happen. Travel doesn't merely broaden the mind, it makes it more. Um, when I was living in Argentina, uh, I, was, I studied at Elon University, and then I moved to uh, Argentina for five months. Uh, and there I was, it was a typical, essentially like textbook situation um, where I was lost and asking for directions. Um, so very much a classroom situation. Um, and I was bumbling through my Spanish uh, and I had lived in Spain, so I had this like Spanish paseo, so it's a Spanish accent, right? Um, and that mixed with my you know, gringo accent. Um, and I was a little bit shamed and, and worried about my accent, um, but the woman that I was talking to who was just a little bit older than I was, she said, oh my goodness, I love your accent. And I thought, what? Uh, my accent sounds terrible, this is awful. Um, and for me, I use this anecdote in my classes because it's something that really pushed me um, to go outside of my comfort zone and it really helped me embrace my accent. And of course, we always need to work on our pronunciation, but for those students that really uh, worry and are very self-conscious about what, what they sound like, this is a story that really helped me um, in my language learning, and um, I think it can really help within the classroom as well. How long is forever? Sometimes just one second. Living in Chile for the first time, um, I had graduated from Elon University and the job market was terrible in 2009, um, so I used my language abilities to teach English abroad. Um, and so when I was down there, it was actually uh, my birthday, so February 27th, uh, 2010, um, so the 12th, 12th year anniversary is coming up, um, and I was out, and it was about three in the morning, and I was on the beach, um, and I walk outside, and um, the dogs all seem to be looking at the ocean. Um, and I get a, like a weird sensation and then all of the earth starts to move. Um, and it's first it's calm um, and then it becomes very violent. Um, and so what was happening, uh, the, the light poles, for example, started to sway back and forth and then they started slamming the, each side of the ground. And then the earth started to move in waves and you could actually physically see it moving in waves because um, I was on the beach and it's very loose land. Uh, and the telephone wires start to snap and you the sparks start to fly and then chaos ensues. People start running everywhere, the dogs are barking, um, the cliffs are spewing rocks. Uh, and um, one of the people that I was with said, we need to go, we need to go, there's gonna be a tsunami. Um, and so we run to the car and the car is like, it had hydraulics in it. It was hopping up and down and we could barely get into it. And finally, once we did get in, um, we, we got in and we drove and I was driving and I was swerving around dogs, people, um, rocks, uh, and we drove up to the cliffs and we overlooked, we stayed up all night um, looking at the, uh, the moon, which was illuminating the ocean, which was moving in ways that I've never seen the ocean move before. And it turned out it was an 8.8 .8 earthquake. It was the fifth largest in the history of humankind and it actually shifted the earth on its axis. Um, and there was a tsunami, just not where I was. Um, and it, it showed me that moment. Um, there's many times where I, I found um, the fragility of life in, in Chile, but, but that, I think, and the violence that of it, of it um, was a moment where it really was undeniable. Travel holds the magical possibility of reinvention, that you find a place you love to begin a new life and never go home. When I lived, I moved from Chile to New Zealand um, and I went on a working holiday visa. Uh, and that is a one year visa where you are essentially, um, well, I found out when I was there, really like a migrant worker. So you have three options, um, which I didn't know. Um, I was coming from Chile. I thought I had all this experience teaching. I had experience writing. I'm gonna get a job in either one of those things. Um, wrong. Um, when I got there, the rude awakening was um, that I had to go back to my college days and my high school days and use my curriculum um, from working in a Pizza Hut or working in Subway um, or working in any restaurants. And I went door to door for three weeks um, trying to find a job in hospitality. Um, 
So the other options would have been um, as a migrant worker, which I, I did pick fruit on a vineyard for a little while, um, or as a uh, construction worker. Um, so when I got the job, I, I started as a busboy in a fine dining restaurant. Um, and I started very much at the bottom of the hierarchy. Uh, and within that year, I studied, um, I studied wine, I studied uh, food, and I studied pairings, um, and I was promoted to manager throughout that year. Um, and I was invited to stay in New Zealand um, for uh, a year, and then another year, and then invited for residency. Um, we decided not to stay. I also met my wife in New Zealand, and we decided to move um, from there. Nothing behind me, everything ahead of me as is ever so on the way. So because we decided to move, um, we were gonna move back to Chile, but we wanted to take a little time to do that. So we decided to take a six month honeymoon. Um, and in that six month honeymoon, we traveled all throughout uh, New Zealand, all throughout Australia, um, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, and then finally into um, the United States and Latin America. Um, and in that time, of course, there are um, a myriad of moments that stand out, uh, but one more so than others um, is when I was uh, on the border from Thailand to Cambodia, um, and we were walking through, it's a land border, um, and when we were there, it was um, one of the sketchiest borders I've ever been through. Uh, and, <laughs> And the, the border guard actually, um, he saw my blue passport, right? Saw this insignia on it, um, saw my skin color, uh, and immediately asked for a bribe. Um, and so I did obviously have to pay that bribe. Um, I was able to negotiate, um, <laughs> but I did pay the bribe. Um, and uh, then I had to write a letter to the Cambodian government thanking them for letting me come into their country. Um, but while we're in this border, and you really are in this limbo, it's like a, it's a very much a purgatorial state, which you're not in one country, and you can't get to this other one. Um, and while we were there, there was uh, an image that will always stick with me, where there was a, a child, a Cambodian child on the ground, uh, naked, um, and kind of writhing in, in suffering. Um, writhing in pain, uh, crying, um, in dirt and mud, um, and the mother was uh, somewhere along the line asking for money, um, and there was no father. And it, the thought occurred to me, um, what is the difference between me and this child? And it, and it really was that passport, right? It was that I was lucky enough to be born with this different skin color, with this uh, blue passport, and within the borders of a different country. And so that is something that I always try to bring to my classroom, so that we can understand our uh, immense privilege um, that we have here. I wish I had come to it sooner. I wish when I was back in that French class that I had connected the conjugation, verbs, and gender nouns to something grander. I wish someone had told me what that class really was, a gate to some blue world. So, after coming from um, Southeast Asia, um, especially with the United States history in Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, I looked a little bit more intensely at my own history. Um, and I wondered why my friends in Chile would call me um, El Gringo or a CIA agent, which they would do often um, in a loving way, but there was definitely <laughs> truth in jest. Um, and so I did go into our history and study that. Um, and this actually led to my master's thesis um, at Middlebury. But I would go to the, for example, the, um, the Museum of Memory um, and Human Rights in Chile, where they have the actual names of the CIA agents um, that helped start the coup in Chile in 1973 that overthrew Allende um, and put Pinochet in power, a, a right of wing dictator um, from 1973 to 1990. Um, so I went through and I read this story and I read all these histories um, of the interventions that we have had within Latin America um, throughout the Cold War. And for me, that was something that was incredibly relevant because we look at the immigration 
what's going on now. There was just an honors project, for example, about Haitian immigrants um, traveling through Latin America. Um, and we demonize these people um, and we marginalize these people without understanding that our government and our place um, has a key role in where we're at right now. Um, so I find that learning our history and not whitewashing our history is essential to our classroom and to learning. I love America more than any other country in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. At Culver, we do claim that we are a leadership school, and that is definitely something that I can get behind. Um, we have the MICE model, which says, challenge the process, enable others to act, and encourage the heart. But how can we be leaders if we blindly follow? So I encourage you to learn your history, understand your privilege, and enable the diaspora who live in limbo to have those same opportunities. So travel to believe, travel to teach, and travel to learn. Travel to become the person you knew you never could.